uh, thank you, Rachel, um, and to the library for, for uh, hosting us. Um, this is uh, a bit of a different kind of event from what I usually do, and I think it's, it's going to be a, um, really interesting because I have read um, Elise's book and uh, really liked it and have lots of questions for her. Um, for those of you who, who don't know who I am, I'm, I'm Paul Dwyeran. I uh, write crime novels about a main game warden named Mike Bowditch. The one that is out now is called Stay Hidden. It takes place on a, a fictional offshore island, um, which may come up in our conversation or not. But um, I think that's all I need to do by way of introduction on my part. Elise, you want to go? Um, yeah, well, I just wanted to say I'm, I'm really happy to be sharing the bill with, with Paul. And as I already told him, I was reading his book last week in preparation for this event, and then, totally by coincidence, my dad gave his book to my husband as a birthday present. So my husband and I have been like sitting side by side, <laughs> reading our copies of the book, saying, like, did you get to this part yet? So it's been like a very big part of our lives for the past week. Um, but I'm really excited to talk about it. Um, my book, If We Had Known, is uh, set in Maine. And it focuses on a, a teacher, a writing professor, who after a shooting realizes that the gunman had been a student of hers some years prior and wrote something for her class that maybe indicated that he was violent, something that she missed. Um, so that's the, yeah, that's the basic premise. Right, I'm going to start off by asking you a question. Um, why did you decide to set this book in Maine? Yeah. Well, Maine is my favorite place in the world. Um, so it may sound really counterintuitive that I set this tragic happening in Maine. Um, I guess for one thing, Maine, there's only so many places I as a writer feel like I can write about with some degree that I have enough familiarity with to, to, to write about in fiction. Um, I've been coming to Maine since I was a little girl. My grandmother was from Denny'sville, Maine. So my grandparents had a house there. I then, um, when I went to college, I got the college guide and I just turned to the M section and chose Bowdoin because I knew I was coming to Maine, so I went to Bowdoin. And then I spent many summers living on Orr's Island writing, and much of this book was actually written while on Orr's Island. So I think on one level I was sort of surrounded by Maine while writing the book. But I think um, maybe more significantly the book is, you know, Maine for me is a place that feels so comforting. Um, a place I sort of equate with a feeling of like security actually and this this event that happens in the book is such a like loss of that feeling so I think maybe that's strangely part of why I set it in Maine because that would underscore to me the feeling of like losing that sense of safety and sort of calmness and goodness well in my books uh, Maine is an incredibly violent and dark place <laughs> where horrible things happen <laughs> Constantly, so. <laughs> yeah, I was curious about just the choice to set yours on an island. Yeah, I've, um, I've been wanting to, to write about a main island for a long time. I grew up uh, on the coast. I grew up in Scarborough, actually, and have lived on, entirely on the coast. Um, but my character is a game warden, and one of the things that you learn if you talk to game wardens is... They spend very little time um, uh, offshore. Uh, I mean, there are several, there are a handful of of islands that have deer populations where there's some hunting or or whatever. So there was this, you know, I had conflicting desires. I guess is what it came down to, where I really wanted to write about an island, but I didn't have a plot in mind. I couldn't figure out a way to get Mike offshore. Uh, is really what it came down to. It's like, well, maybe he's out like recreationally fishing and the boat sinks. I don't, you know, it was just stupid things. Um, but uh, eventually I, I, I got to this place in his life where I promoted him to a warden investigator, which is kind of a plainclothes detective for, for the warden service. And uh, they investigate hunting homicides, which is the term for what we call hunting accidents. Um, which are not accidents typically, 
Uh, and I said, oh, I could, I could, I got it. <laughs> I could have this, you know, I could, there could be an island that has, a, that has deer on it, and it's hunting season, and somebody gets shot on the island, and Mike has a reason to actually go to one. Uh, and so, so I started to write this book and about this island, and I realized that I, I, it probably could have been like 750 pages long, because I, 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 there's so much I wanted to write about, um, just because I'd never had a chance before to do an island. And for me, when I read the book, it also allowed for this element of kind of lawlessness or just the fact that they're so cut off and kind of like living by their own rules. Um, I'm curious about something. You, ha you wanted him on the island and needed to get him on the island. So do your books often start with sort of a place? Or Very often, yes. I, uh, the, way that I, the way that I start each of the books is, is actually by trying to figure out where Mike Bowditch is in his life. You know, I say to myself, um, where is he personally? Where is he professionally? And then I <clears throat> try to come up with uh, a story that brings to the forefront whatever struggle he's going through. And very often, the setting kind of, you know, comes from that. But I, the books move around the state of Maine quite a bit, and, uh, um, and that's by um, by choice, it's, I like to showcase um, the fact that Denny'sville, how many people know where Denny'sville is, by the way? Okay. Um, Denny'sville is way down east. It's, real, it's a beautiful, beautiful place. Um, and uh, I have not, I think I might have mentioned Denny'sville in a book, um, but I have not like, literally said a, a, a story there. Um, so, one of the things that I really responded to in your book is I write about, uh, my main character is, is um, uh, I'm trying to think of the right word to just, he's deeply flawed. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and one of the things that I liked about, about your, your book was that Maggie, who's the teacher who had this, um, this, this really troubled young man in her class and failed to, to sort of recognize that he might be potentially violent. Um, as I'm, I was reading the book, I could see her making mistakes all the way through. I'm like, oh no, don't do that. Don't do that, don't do that. And so I, in, in some ways I felt like I was getting a taste of my own medicine because I know that that's how people read my books. Um, uh, what, were, what was it that you were trying to, to accomplish? I mean, both with Maggie uh, as a teacher and as a mother in this, because her daughter goes through um, a real hardship in the course of the book. Right. Yeah, I mean, um, the original idea for novel. I've been teaching creative writing for about 20 years. Um, and I actually started working on this, the idea for this book about 10 years ago, shortly after the Virginia Tech shooting. There was an interview with the shooter's creative writing teacher um, who said she had seen this very troubling material, kind of violent material in his writing and had known that he needed help and in fact tried to get him help, unlike what happens in my story. Um, but I was so haunted by that interview and just thinking about, um, I had never had a student write something so unambiguously violent, but I've definitely had students writing things that have concerned me. Um, and there are moments where you just wonder, is this, do I need to intervene or this is fiction, but is it really? And, um, I think those moments come up for writing teachers and all teachers a lot, just thinking, you know, is this a student who really needs help? Um, so I was thinking first about the teacher, and I wanted her to be, I think she's actually a very devoted teacher um, at the expense of a lot of other things in her life, which is where the flawed part comes in. Um, she sort of neglected her marriage. She kind of overlooked her own daughter's problems, even as she's so focused on her students' problems, um, her daughter had a lot of things going on that sort of got by her. So I deliberately wanted to have the daughter in there 
Um, at the time the, the story is told, the daughter is the same age as her students and heading off to college herself. So I wanted that parallel to be there where the daughter is actually in the position of Maggie's students going off to college, a troubled young woman. Um, are there people at her college on her campus who are paying attention and getting her help? Um, so that feels like a long answer to your question, but. <laughs> no, 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 it was a great answer. Um, so um, just thinking again about Mike Bowditch and the deep flaws, when you write, this is I guess just a bigger question about the series, um, how do you sustain, so you have each sort of individual really like tightly plotted story, but then you must be thinking long range about the character and how he's evolving and what he's going through. I guess just how do you, how do you balance the two? Keep his story just moving and interesting. That's a really hard question. I'm gonna go in the back room and think about it for <laughs> five minutes. Um, well, it is very much, most mystery series are, are books, are, you know, are, consist of books that you can just pick up and you don't really need to know what happened in the last book. And there's a reason for that because they sell well. Um, you know, you don't want to make people feel like, oh, I can't read this book because I haven't read the other one and, and that sort of thing. So I have an editor who really sort of, try to tries to keep me on task and make sure that each book, you know, can be read by someone who hasn't read any of the others. You know, I mean, it, it, to varying degrees that's successful or not, but what's happened is that I've come to, to look at my books less as a series and more as a saga, um, in the sense that, yeah, you can read each book individually, but there's a lot in them that you, you uh, hopefully, you, you gain from, you know, from knowing, the, you know, how some of the relationships formed several books ago or, or that sort of thing. So it is a bit, uh, it's a bit hard to sort of keep it all in, in mind. I mean, it, it, it reminds me of, um, uh, you know, like George R. R. Martin. It's like, how does he... How does he have this Game of Thrones world? Like, how does he know, you know, all the, all the, the supporting characters that he's mentioned over the years and, and things? I mean, I've had to put together a sort of a series Bible where to remind myself, oh yeah, uh, you know, Colonel Malcolm has this color eyes because I just don't want to get those details wrong from book to book or whatever. So, I mean, that, again, I'm not sure that's really answering your question, but it's, it's, um, it is a, it's a bit of a struggle, but it's, it also, I also find it compelling, um, and, and it keeps me moving forward. I feel like, okay, where am I going to take him next? Uh, one, one thing I wanted to bring up about yours, which is probably kind of a little bit, a, might, you might have considered to be a strange question, is this is a, 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 a compliment I loved the way that you dealt with social media in the book. I feel like uh, most novelists that I read do not know what to do with our culture when it comes to things like Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter. It, it, and it's because it's hard and you feel like it's ever changing and yet it's so defining of the way that we live now and I wondered, like, you know, you must have known going in that that was going to be sort of a stumbling block, and yet you made it central to the plot of your, uh, of your story. I mean, what happens essentially is that it, the, the public gets wind of the fact that, that Maggie, the teacher, had, had read the student's disturbing essay, and it sort of goes viral, and everybody suddenly is attacking Maggie and attacking her daughter, and and this sort of thing. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, um, I'm in real life not much of a so social media person, are you? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and when I started the actually I, I envisioned it, it was just going to be told from Maggie, the teacher's point of view. As I kept writing it, other perspectives crept in, like the daughter, who's like now a fairly big part of the book is her story. Um, one had 
I had a, a character who was 18 telling a lot of the story. I knew that I needed to address social media. Um, but I did so with great trepidation because I'm really not a savvy social media person. I'm much more like Maggie in that respect. Um, but just in thinking about the response to these tragedies, um, social media would just inevitably have to be addressed in the book, I thought. And, I, and unlike most of my books where I, I don't maybe pin down the story in time, this one I felt like I needed to know exactly what year it was set, just because the climate around all of this and around gun violence is changing so much and has, it, from the time I started working on it, actually changed so much. Um, so yes, so social media, I, I turned to my students who are 18 and exactly the, um, the savviest age for this kind of thing. So I actually ended up giving them some portions of the book and asking them to vet the social media talk and making sure that it sounded authentic. And the, and the funny slash sad thing is that the biggest comment they gave me was that it needed to be more mean. It wasn't mean enough. And they said, people go on social media and they're mean. So I took that note. Um, but yes, it, it became a much bigger part of the book than I expected. Um, but fortunately, I did have people sort of reading it along the way and giving me tips. Um, one thing I didn't know was that actually abbreviating in text is not really something my students do. Um, they, uh, they, I think they consider the texting as like such just a form of talking. Um, I had kind of thought they would use more of that shorthand, but they said they don't really. Anyway, so, news to me. Um, um, I was thinking, um, my mind is back on your last comment <laughs> about your book. Um, just about, like, you talked about the development of the series, um, but thinking about the development of the individual books, to me, um, um, writing a mystery seems so daunting. When you, I'm just wondering how that kind of evolves for you. Do you have the whole thing set in your mind before you write it? Are you ever surprised along the way by who did it? Uh, <laughs> uh, every once in a while, I'm surprised by that. Yeah, I, um, I'm not a meticulous outliner. I don't sit down and map out the entire book chapter by chapter or, or whatever. Um, and uh, the reason I don't do that is primarily is because when I read, I can read a book and sort of tell when a writer has done that. And I feel like it's, there's a certain uh, heartlessness, not heartlessness, but soullessness to that approach. I mean, you're, you're almost taking your characters and moving them like chess pieces because you need them to do certain things for the, in service to the plot. Um, and what I prefer to do is to sort of think of the characters and let the characters make decisions. Um, you know, I've said this many times before, but I, I feel like if I'm not surprised, you're not going to be surprised. So I begin with a sense of, you know, I know what the crime is. I think I know who did it. And, you know, generally, I don't know how I'm going to get to the end. Um, uh, and, but I, the challenge, again, the challenge of that, I think, is one of the things that really drives me. And I, I like to be able to go off on detours while I'm writing. And then, you know, obviously when you're revising, you have to, you know, go and get rid of the dead ends and, and connect things that are sort of disconnected in the first draft. But, um, but I, yeah, I, I don't like really overly deterministic mysteries unless you know, they were written by Agatha Christie. So. Well, I found it as I was reading it so suspenseful and surprising and really spooky. You know, maybe part of that was the setting, but it felt really eerie. Yeah, I was going for a gothic. Yeah. Gothic book. Uh, I, I, you know, I like gothic, you know. This is actually a related, very specific question about the I thought it was really interesting how the deer or this presence, this, um, this overpopulation of deer on this, on this island. Um, and I could see it's, it had sort of a function plot-wise, but it also just felt more symbolic or atmospheric or something. I was just curious about that choice. Yeah, so in Stay Hidden, one of the, one of the, the aspects of the, of the book is that the island is overpopulated with deer. Um, and this is something that... Uh, 
is, is a problem on several main islands. Currently, Islesboro has been dealing with this uh, pretty profoundly, or, or I would say not dealing with it. Um, and it was a big problem on Monhegan Island years and years ago. And what they ended up doing was they ended up hiring a, a, a guy and his company to come in and to exterminate all of the deer from the island just because there were so many and they had become sickly. Uh, but but um, you know, from a human perspective, what was worse was that they were carrying Lyme ticks. Um, and you know, a large proportion of the, the population had come down with Lyme disease. And um, so that was a public health issue. So I said to myself, well, okay, on my fictional island, I want to have that overpopulation problem um, going on because it is where you have that, um, it, it's very disconcerting. I don't, I don't know if anybody's ever been to a place where, uh, or lives in a place where deer are so uh, accustomed to not being hunted and having people around all the time that they begin to act almost tame or uh, you know, they act in a way that's not really the way that a deer is supposed to, to act. I mean, deer, deer are, are really, um, uh, sort of the essence of a deer is its ability to elude being hunted. I mean, that's what makes a, a deer. And so when you have deer that are sort of kind of functioning like uh, livestock, you know, it's, it's wrong. It's, it's, there's something fundamentally flawed about that. And, and so I did a, lo I, I, a lot of research ab about places that have suffered these sorts of things. And, and I learned things, you know, like for instance, that uh, there's a scene in the book where the deer are on the beach eating seaweed um, because there's just not enough browse for them elsewhere. This does happen. Um, it happens off of uh, islands off of Alaska and, and elsewhere. And so, you know, it's, it's, I mean, that's one of the fun things about writing a book, when you, you set yourself this goal and, to, you know, you have to learn, learn things in order to write the book um, and, uh, and do research. What kind of research did you end up doing beyond your, you know, vetting your social media posts? Vetting the, the Twitter? Um, yeah, well, the, I guess the, the most considerable and also most kind of harrowing research I had to do was just about um, the psychology of shooters. Um, the shooter is not actually in the novel at all. He's kind of like the absent center because he dies at the scene. Um, but all the different characters had some kind of connection to him or remember him in a, in a different way. So I wanted to make sure that I had an idea of who he was um, so that all of these other people could sort of um, think about him and remember him and look at him realistically. So that research was, was pretty harrowing, just reading about different accounts. And um, I felt very concerned with just trying to get details right, even just like the response to the scene or the feelings there. Um, yeah, it was an unusual book. And then it just coming out when it did, it was, um, we were talking a little about this already, but just a difficult book to feel like promoting, <laughs> just because of what it's about. Um, in a way, uh, you don't want to feel like you're exploiting a situation like this. On the other hand, writers respond to what's happening in the world. So there were actually several books that came out this spring on similar topics, so I can see why writers are kind of reacting to this thing, but it feels like a complicated sort of book to, to yeah, to go out promoting, like I am right now. <laughs> <laughs> There's, I, I always find that too, there's sort of this line between being topical and then being too topical. You know, when you have an idea for a book, you say, geez, um, that's, that just seems like, it just seems like, you know, we're really, we're really dealing with this as a culture right now, but, you know, if you have to anticipate that it's going to take you a year to write, and then it's going to take, you know, months for it to be, to go through the publishing process and who knows what the state of things is going to be when the book finally comes out. So, you know, you sort of tackle a, a topical subject at your own risk and you sort of, you just hope that it's going to 
it's going to belong in part of you know the national dialogue or whatever you want to call it. But uh, yeah, and because I started working on it when I did ten years ago, it wasn't as topical, right. <laughs> and has just yeah the climate around it has changed so much. Um, yeah. Um, hopping topics again. Um, but thinking about the deer and thinking about what you said about research, um, I was interested in, I know you have a huge fan base in Maine, but then you also got readers obviously outside of Maine who might not know as many of the sort of um, Maine specific details. I mean, even just something like, there's a line in the book, something like lobster bugs, that's what we call lobsters here or something like that. Um, but I wonder just how do you know, like how far to go with that? The lines that are kind of explanatory about main details? Yeah, I mean, I think that, so my, let's see how to answer this question, and I think there's sort of two aspects to it. One is that the main character is a game warden, um, which means that he, he lives outdoors, he understands the natural world in ways that most of us who don't have that kind of a lifestyle, um, uh, you know, can't really comprehend. And so I have to, in order to sort of bring him to life, I have to do a certain amount of expository stuff. Um, I, I recently uh, was thinking about it and saying to myself, okay, you know what, one of the differences between writing about a game warden and say, you know, who, who in, in rural Maine versus writing about a, a public, uh, I mean, a private investigator in New York is, I could say to you right now, um, uh, okay, the next scene takes place in um, a subway station in August uh, on the hottest day of the year. And even those of us who don't live in New York have probably been in a subway station. I mean, that's probably all I need to say. But if I say to you, the next scene takes place um, in a cedar swamp in June. Now, all of those New Yorkers don't know what that means, <laughs> right? They don't realize that Mike is going to be, you know, like sucked of all of his blood by <laughs> The black flies. Um, so I have to put that kind of thing in, and you know, there's a, but I don't want to do too much of it. Um, and uh, it, you know, it's it's always a bit of a balancing act that way. Um, I won't say beyond that, but um, so I found it interesting. I have to say that in your book that. The, the note that, that triggers this whole, um, the, the story is, uh, the, the essay that triggered the story was about this shooter going out hunting. It was a fictional hunting trip. I think I can, that's not a spoiler, is it? I hope. Um, but uh, in my books, everybody goes hunting. <laughs> Um, but I, th I, I mean, you know, I, I, but I, I read it and said, yeah, you know, I, I think, though, it does speak to the fact that people in many places, you know, look at, at hunters as people who are interested in guns. I mean, I think, to me, that was the thing that I responded more to was, was the fact that he was in his essay, he was talking about different kinds of guns and what would be most efficient, at, you know, to do different things. Um, yeah, I mean, that was one of the things that I've just found as a writing teacher, that it's, um, it's, it's not always just what the students are writing about, it's maybe the way that they're writing about it that's concerning. Um, I mean, I have a lot of students who write just scenes of violence, and that's a lot of what they see in movies, and that's how they think of stories. Um, and, you know, I, and that comes up in my classes a lot. But it's, it's sometimes just the way that it's written. It's like so gratuitous or so gleeful or something that just feels a little off. And so I think, 
I, actually, back to your question about setting it in Maine, precisely in part because it is in Maine, it's, so it's a story about a, a boy who goes hunting with his dad, which is like not unusual. Um, and, and so I think part of why it didn't raise any kind of red flags for his teacher, but looking back, it was kind of the way that he wrote obsessively about the guns and the kinds of guns and what the guns did. Um, of course, after the shooting happens, that might look different. And I think that's part of what happened too. It's interesting, like I've met with several groups of teachers who thought she was, n she was not wrong. Like she, oh, I don't think she, she was wrong she either. She did not miss something. No, I, I, I didn't either. I think, uh, you know, uh, I, I mean, I, I felt like it, she, she knew he was a strange kid. And, you know, she knew she, he was a little scary, but that didn't necessarily right. mean that he was going to, four years later, you know, go shoot up a mall. So. Yeah, I mean, I think it's the kind of thing in that instance, you know, in hindsight, it just looked bigger. You know, it looked like it had a big, it was like in bold letters or something and everyone missed it. But at the time, it wouldn't have been perceived that way. I mean, I think, um, back to all of her flaws, which are many, um, I think what she missed at the time was just that that kid was a troubled kid and sitting in her class. And she was more concerned with the rest of the students. Like, she didn't want him to take away from the experience for the rest of the students who she loved, and she wanted to, you know, just focus on them and not focus on this kid. Um, and, and that was probably a misstep, more so than the, than the paper. Yeah. Do you think we should ask for questions? Sure. Hi, thanks. Uh, first of all, thank you. Fascinating. Uh, can each of you name a couple of your favorite authors and maybe why they are that, that way? And uh, this one little follow up, which is uh, there's a Telling how your story seems to be ripped from the headlines. <laughs> and, and it's sort of vocal and all that. So, what I wanted to ask you, Paul, is uh, have you met Roxanne Quimby and how did you get along with her? I guess I need to answer this one first then. Um, so, the Roxanne Quimby uh, question, I think, it has, refers to my fourth book, Massacre Pond, which, was, uh, which is about a wealthy woman who wants to create a national park in the state of Maine. I wrote that book when um, uh, the, the proposal seemed at that stage to be entirely dead in the water. Um, it really was languishing and Roxanne Quimby had not handed it over to her son Lucas St. Clair. Um, it, it came out of, I'll try to be very brief about this, my, my editor is also was the editor of um, Jackie Collins, and so he he would kept he kept saying to me, Paul, can't you put like a rich, glamorous <laughs> woman in in your books? And I'm I'm like, you know, they're really game wardens don't meet <laughs> rich, glamorous women. Uh, but I found a way, um, and so what I did was actually I, I just I transformed the character. She's sort of a more of a She's a combination maybe of Roxanne and Martha Stewart and <laughs> I don't know. But um, I have not met her. And in fact, when I made the decision to write the book, I stopped reading about her because I wanted my character to be her own you know, person. Um, in terms of you know, some of the authors that, that I read that um, I think are, you know, influential in my life. I mean, I, certainly, I mean, if I want to go back, I mean, Hemingway is always right there in the first and foremost, but of contemporary crime writers, uh, James Lee Burke is probably at the top of my list. He writes, um, he's very prolific. I, the, the series of his that I like the best is about a Louisiana detective named Dave Robichaux, who's a recovering alcoholic and um, just a really strong character. He's, he's uh, Burke is great at, at bringing his settings to life, and I remember reading um, those er the early books in the series, never having been to Louisiana, but feeling like I had once I put them down, and I said to myself, well, that's what I want to do with my books. I want my books to bring Maine to life for people who 
have never visited Maine before. Um, but, I mean, there's so many good uh, contemporary crime writers out there now. Michael Conley is somebody. I read every book. Uh, I'm trying to think. Um, we have John Conley, and, who's an Irish writer. It's in town. He lives part of the year in Portland. Uh, John's a great guy and a great writer. Yeah, I gravitate toward, um, this might seem odd since I wrote a novel that involves a shooting, but I really like sort of quieter, um, like character-based stories and stories that are kind of about everyday dramas. Um, even though my book might sound a little scary, it's really much more of a like quiet, character-centric kind of a story. Um, I mostly, I love short story writers, I think because they kind of deal in quiet moments. I really love Tobias Wolf, Andre Dubuse, Alice Munro. One of my favorite books of all time, I read it once a year, is Olive Kitteridge, which probably many of you have read. I think Olive is <clears throat> sort of the embodiment of my grandmother from Denny'sville. So <laughs> I read it frequently. Um, yeah, but those are the types of stories I like. I get it. Um, I've been fascinated with the, with the age of uh, some of your characters in the board because he's younger than my youngest son, and so I'm kind of projecting my son out there. And I was wondering if, if, if as, as your books progress, are you going to age him a bit? Yeah, so, so Mike Bodich is 24 in the first book, and he's, he, he's a sort of a... Uh, emotionally stunted 24 even, I would say. Um, he's only 29 in Stay Hidden, so it's over the course of nine books, he's only gotten five years older. Uh, I do try to, you know, I've been trying to mature him slowly <laughs> but surely through the series. Um, the, the laughter indicates that I've had uh, uh, maybe partial success. Um, <laughs> doing that and and you know i yeah i mean i think that is the goal is to try to to make this character to grow him up in a way that's believable um and uh you know it, it, again i find that really fascinating you know one of the things that we're also dealing with in, i mean top in a topical way is we're dealing with a lot of conversation about young men who are not maturing you know I mean, typically it's been referred to, you know, people who are living with their parents and, and, and it's, it's been, you know, a function of the, it was a function of the recession maybe and, and this sort of thing. So um, uh, I, I didn't really get into it thinking that that would be some, an aspect of what I was writing. Uh, the, the strangest piece of this for me is that I started right when I started writing the first book, Mike and I were much closer together in age and I'm aging a lot faster <laughs> than he is, so. Elise, um, when you were doing research on your uh, shooters, the young men that were shooters, did you find any similarities in their uh, formative, formative years or their upbringings of things that happened to them? Think. Um, I think I more found similarities in, say, how their last few years, like how they were described, and um, like what struck me um, about a lot of the a lot of the the descriptions that I read was this, um, like uh, young men who felt isolated and then found. A kind of community in this like world online of about shootings and shooters and um, that it was those so isolated you know sitting at a computer in their room felt like they were part of something um, and that was part of what it was providing I guess pre-internet that just sort of wasn't there um, but that really struck me in in several in several cases it was interesting I um, I got an email recently from a woman I knew years ago, but her sister had taught the Parkland shooter like two years ago and <clears throat> was apparently just like totally shocked, like never had seen anything that would indicate 
um, that he was capable of what he did. So um, anyway, that just occurs to me because it was just thinking about how they're you know perceived. And even just two years ago, she was um, she just would not have thought. I think in the past couple of years, things changed so much. Um, but that was the thing that maybe more so than like a specific thing in their childhoods, like that was the thing that really stood out, and the kind of thing the world of the online world provides. Um, at some point, you have to give up your um, baby, and marketing takes over, I guess. And I'm just wondering if you could speak to two things, the choice of title and the choice of cover art. Because the more I read about those in a world is filled with images and things for sale and choices, cover art's important and your title separate from what's behind those two things can make a real difference. And I wondered how much of a say you have in it or how that process happens for you. Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I've, I have had, I've always been able to give feedback, I guess, um, though ultimately the, the decisions have felt like the publisher's decisions, particularly about the cover art. Um, I don't actually think I've titled any of my novels. <laughs> this this title, I think, was the suggestion of like an intern in my agent's office or something. I don't even know. Um, and I, to be honest, I didn't love it. It felt a little bit just like it lacked. It didn't feel that distinctive or something. Um, but it sort of got traction, and that was the one that everybody liked. Um, a uh, kind of funny and disappointing thing happened with my cover. The original cover was kind of an aerial view of like a painting of a small town, and I loved it. And then Celeste Eng, who has a best-selling book called Little Fires Everywhere, her book came out, and it's the same painter, and the <laughs> same, not the same image, but like a detail from that. So they're like, we didn't copy it, but we can't use it because it will look like we copied it, so we had to change it. Um, so that was disappointing. I mean, I think that kind of thing happens a lot. Um, yeah, I was concerned because they have a, a, a sort of like bullet hole in, the, in one of the letters on the cover, and I was really concerned about that. And I guess that's just a question, like, do you need that there for people to realize what the book's about or to create a sense of tension? Um, I was unsure about it, and I'm still unsure about it, but I ultimately kind of lost that battle. But I think your cover looks like a movie poster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, my publisher has a rule that there can be no bullet holes on the cover. <laughs> or, um, or, like, rifle sights, like where somebody's my, in a spot. How did my know, book end up with a bullet hole on it? I don't know. <laughs> um, my, in my case... You know, my contract says that I get to consult on the the cover art, uh, and I forget what it says specifically about the titles. I have titled every one of my books, but in many cases, the title is the twentieth one that I proposed. I mean, <laughs> and in one case, actually, in Bad Little Falls, it was the th I think it was the third title I proposed but they forced me to do 20 and then decided that number three was okay after all. Um, you know, and, and in terms of the art, uh, the story I always tell about, about the sort of my relationship to the art, of the cover art is, um, they will, my, my publisher, my editor will, they'll sort of work on it in secret. Um, they have a title from me, and they have a description of the book, although at that point, because of the way that I write, they have to be working on this even before they've read my book. So you can imagine the difficulty of trying to come up with a cover for something that, you know, they don't know what it's going to be. Um, and very often they will, instead of like sending me a, a computer image of the, the, the cover, they will actually send me a printed cover, which they've wrapped around some random book, um, so that I'm, I, I'm able to hold it in my hands. And, you know, along with a note that says, isn't this fantastic? This is, 
we are so excited about this. So what am I going to say? You know, like, no, I hate this. I can't, you know, I can't go with it. Um, so, you know, I do, sometimes I will suggest some, some tweaks, but I've realized that that's the, the limit. And, you know, in fairness, um, I think especially with titles, they've saved me from, from some titles that I know I would have regretted. So, uh, there you go. One more question. How about you? So, in both of your books are named motion pictures. <laughs> which actor or actress? <laughs> 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 Well, when I, you know, the funny thing is, is that when I, when I first started writing the book, I got that, I've gotten that question for nine years. And so, you know, my 24-year-old character was, you know, like nine years ago, I would have said, you know, oh, I think uh, Channing, Channing Tatum would have been fine for this role or whatever. And now Channing Tatum is in his mid-30s, right? He's too old for the role. So it's like I have to be constantly on the lookout for, for like the, you know, the, the, the newest sort of heartthrob, you know, that's kind of coming up through the teenage ranks because he'll probably age into that perfectly into the role if that ever happens. So if you have some suggestions, my books have been optioned and they're looking, you know, they're looking for actors, so send them my way. <laughs> Oh gosh, I have never been asked that question. I don't have an answer at the ready, but um, I, I think I'm going to go with Frances McDormand because Maggie is uh, kind of a tough, you know, she's got the form, kind of a tough character, so that would likely be a good fit. 